Well, I will say good morning and good evening to people from all around the world who are joining us today and also to those who are not able to join us today but who have asked for the recording and we know you'll watch it when you do wake up uh, and sorry that we can't find a time that works for everybody uh, but um, I'm trying to alternate them so we capture everyone um, but I'd just like to say welcome to this uh, very informal seminar hosted by the Urban Cycling Institute. Uh, thanks Marco for having us. I'm Roxanne Bo, I'm the Executive Director of CanCycle, uh, the Cambridge Cycling Campaign in the United Kingdom. Um, this concept just started as a few of us wanting to get together and have a chat uh, and it just seemed that everybody wanted to get involved in our chat so now we've just opened it up to everybody um, but i'll just remind everyone we're being recorded um, after our presentation and our questions we'll switch it off if we've got time so we can have a bit of a discussion at the end as well uh, but i will start by introducing our guest speaker uh, we have simon monk who is the infrastructure um, campaigner, infra cycling infrastructure campaigner for London Cycling Campaign. And uh, Simon, we, we caught up in February. You came and spoke at Cam Cycles monthly meeting, and none of this was included. <laughs> Yeah, strangely enough yeah. <laughs> yeah the world has changed a little bit since then i know i know i'm so glad that we got you to cambridge while we could um but uh you know simon's work in london particularly on the um walthamstow mini holland which simon will talk about um and his campaigning work i think represents a real turning point in london cycling um and cycling infrastructure and and I think that that has helped set the stage for what we'll talk about today and the amazing activity that is happening in London. Where are we at the moment? We are in a new golden age of cycling, apparently, according to the Prime Minister of the UK. Um, so on the, I believe, just the 6th of May, we had Boris Johnson announce in Parliament um, this new golden age of cycling. Um, and I don't think anyone was expecting such a bold statement um, in British politics, to be frank. Uh, we were all jumping up and down. Would you agree, Simon? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's interesting times. We, we're for, for the UK. So one of the, one of the things that I'm no doubt we'll talk about is the fact that we're um, compared to most other European cities, compared to most, most of the global cities in London, we have an incredibly fractured kind of political strata, um, as it were. So we have 33 boroughs, then we have a regional mayor, then we have English control, then we have UK, etc. Um, and it's just an incredible moment where everyone from the top all the way down to the bottom are all basically saying the same thing. That's, that's really never happened before. So for the Prime Minister to come out and say it's a golden age for cycling, and for then Grant Shapps, and, uh, the Transport Minister, to, to kind of put out the guidance he has done and essentially every every English council must you know do loads of stuff for walking cycling during this crisis um, and then for the mayor to say what he said and then the boroughs etc you know that's that's like it's like the planets the stars have aligned for, for a moment which is quite strange yeah absolutely and and that that announcement as Simon said it came then with further announcement from our secretary of transport um, of a two billion fund for cycling um, including a 250 million pound emergency fund um, and that sounds like lots of money but actually it's money that had already been announced several times really <laughs> I mean, this, this money's been recycled a few times and no one's actually seen any of it um, but again it sounded different this time because it came with government guidance and this guidance was quite strong saying things like measures should be taken as swiftly as possible and the government therefore expects local authorities to make significant changes to their road layouts to give more space to cyclists and pedestrians um, and again we've never had such strong wording or instruction from the top um, and we've now seen it filter down to local authorities in um in a range of ways. Some have taken to it a bit more than others. Uh, here in Cambridge, we're having lots of um, fabulous press releases, but not really a lot of action yet. Uh, but in London, things are happening. And so, Simon, how did we get to this point? And I'll hand over to you. What happened in the past to help things happen now and what's going to happen in the future? Over to you. 
Cool. Do you want to do you want to hit the next slide? Uh, I so, will. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, that, by the way, by the way, before we go off this slide, that this is lovely. That was a lovely uh, picture of Lambeth of uh, pavement widening uh, that got done in Brixton. Brixton has incredibly narrow pavements, um, and almost instantly, local local community folks just got out and did that. So that was just a spontaneous kind of uh, expression of of happiness and love and hope and whatever. So it's a very lovely picture. Uh, cool, so if we jump on to the next slide, um, a little bit about myself really. Uh, so I'm uh, Simon Monk, the infrastructure campaigner for London Cycling Campaign as, as uh, Roxanne introduced me very kindly. Um, I'm also a resident in Walthamstow in Waltham Forest, which is a northeast outer London borough, uh, kind of suburban area of, of uh, London. Um, and from about 2005, I was a campaigner volunteer uh, in Waltham Forest uh, while also being a journalist. Um, and uh, Waltham Forest was an utterly unremarkable uh, suburb of, of London for, for at the time, um, you know, in, in many ways it still is, but, um, but in many ways it isn't. Um, so at the time, you know, the, the council attitude to cycling was, well, we gave you one of those boxes at the front of the lights, what we call an ASL or advanced stop line. Um, we gave you one of those boxes. What more could you possibly want? We just don't understand you cyclists. You just, uh, you just want, 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 and you're no, never satisfied. Um, so cycling in, in uh, that bit of outer London was, was hairy to say the least. Um, you know, it was only for the fast, the fit, the confident, the fearless. Um, people like me, in other words, who'll cycle despite conditions uh, and kind of possibly may have mental health uh, issues and challenges because of our willingness to cycle in, in almost any conditions. Uh, but the mammals, you know, middle-aged men in Lycra, as, uh, as we call them. Um, so, so what changed? Well, around about 2007, 2008, I was just getting mightily hacked off, um, as were some other campaigners, with this council attitude. Um, and we did something about it. Uh, I did a thing called Movers and Shakers where we spent a year getting council leaders out on bikes. I'm going, to, I'm going to, by the way, take complete credit for everything that's happened in London uh, since 2005. So just, just for everyone to be aware of that, but uh, there we go. Um, so uh, around 2008, 2009, we did a thing called Movers and Shakers where we got council leaders out one-on-one -on, -one on bikes. Um, and suddenly doing that led some of those council leaders to, to go from, well, we gave you an ASL, what more could you possibly want, um, to, oh, okay, we could see that giving you an ASL wasn't actually very useful and, and didn't really get you out on bikes. Um, we had the council leader who was in his mid-60s, I think, at the time, ride down Leebridge Road, which is the most dangerous road in uh, the whole, or was the most dangerous road in the whole of the area, um, and the, the, the one used by most cyclists as a commuter through route, um, was was one of the most horrific roads um he rode he you know to his credit he rode down uh, the road in his mid-60s having not been on a bike for for a decade um and i think that led to a real kind of moment where the, the council really understood what was going on um that led to the 2012 action plan around the olympic games we got a little bit of money from uh, from london to do a few things um and essentially the council leader by that point sat down with us and said, well, what, what is it you do want what do, what is it you cyclists want um that then led to things like 20 miles an hour for the whole borough, the 10 worst junctions in the borough fixed, etc. Um, and that then led to the Mini Holland bid. Boris Johnson in 2013 announced a programme for, for London boroughs to bid, out of London boroughs to bid for, for Mini Holland funding. In the end, three boroughs got Mini Holland funding. Um, I get very emotional about this, as you can probably hear, so, so I may cry, uh, I may ramble, that is the way of things. Um, but uh, we got 30 million for, for Walter Forest as one of the three boroughs. And since then, what's happened because of the political will um, that had been generated in Walter Forest is we became essentially the gold standard for London. Um, the schemes that are now in, and you can probably see some of them on the screen, uh, these are roads that are, that are very near my house right you know right now and are, are absolutely quite spectacular at the moment uh, to see um, these schemes have become the gold standard for London they've become the gold standard for the UK um, we've had visits so so my colleagues in Walter Forest Cycling Campaign who also deserve massive credit as to a cost of thousands um, but Paul Gasson and Dan Kelly um, who who helped get these schemes in and keep these in as campaigners have since gone on to do like a hundred plus tours including um i took around a bunch of folks from bogota uh we've had people from japan denmark um we've had dutch engineers come over which is quite strange so there's just been a huge shift in uh in in 
perception of the area um, and more importantly as well as the international plaudits and acclaim um, these schemes have resulted in just huge amounts of people walking and cycling um, and a wider range of people which is really important so um, Leebridge Road which is the bottom right hand corner um, and is, is on my um, is on my uh, uh, profile picture like you can see at the background behind me um, that Leebridge Road scheme, uh, you know, I'm quite often now riding along there at the moment and you'll see uh, women in hijabs, you'll see uh, people with trikes, family bikes. Uh, so that was that was Mini Holland. And then from the Mini Holland, the start of the success of the Mini Holland schemes, um, I then uh, went from that to work at London Cycling Campaign. Um, in parallel, and if we switch from that slide to the next, please, Roxanne. Uh, in parallel, uh, the London Cycling Campaign were also up to a bunch of stuff. Um, in uh, around 2012, 2013, they ran the, the well, in 2012, they ran the Love London Go Dutch uh, campaign, which was probably one of the most successful cycling advocacy campaigns ever. Um, and it took Boris Johnson, who was the mayor at that point, uh, to then become uh, a mayor who, who wasn't just talking about blue paint, um, which he had done up until that point, but to start to build the cycle soup highways. This is a picture of the North South cycle soup highway. Uh, it is uh, at Blackfriars Bridge. The, the handful of schemes that we had in before the crisis under Boris um, have been dramatically successful. Um, and, and they are again, a tale of, I think, uh, campaigning advocacy. We have, have campaigned for these, we campaigned for this directly. We asked for uh, specific schemes um, and got them. Um, what we've also done, and, and I guess the theme of this entire presentation um, is really about political will. And, and that's, I think that's what's really important for me to talk about and remind myself that I'm talking about, um, is that Boris went from blue paint to cycle superhighways um, and went, left office in London and went to become prime minister to usher in a golden age of cycling under uh, this situation. So we have created a situation where our advocacy, uh, um, LCC's advocacy, but other organizations as well have created a situation where politicians in London cannot um, and will not openly say oh I hate cycling or cycling's rubbish or we're not going to do anything for cycling etc in fact the argument over separate space for cycling is basically one the argument over kind of the need for cycling is one um, yeah the argument is one um, and indeed really the question is definitely like how fast we go how bold we can be etc but, but politicians really understand now the situation and kind of embrace it in a very real way. Um, we then, in the run-up to uh, Sadiq Khan, we ran a campaign called Sign for Cycling. Pretty much everyone signed up to triple the mileage of protected space on main roads um, and deliver a mini Holland in every borough. Um, Sadiq has pretty much gone on to do arguably everything he said he would um it's a you know it, it's a kind of uh, there's been some spin around what he's done but let's make no mistake what we've seen is a massive expansion of the cycle network in london under his uh four years and we've seen a rollout of schemes into boroughs and we've seen a load of other stuff in that period what we've also done is we've really cemented our role i think as lcc do more do better be brave be bold you know, it's great, keep going, etc. Um, that has led to the mass transport strategy, which is a really bold document, but also to embracing concepts like low traffic neighborhoods, which which weren't pioneered in Waltham Forest, but were very much part of the, the Waltham Forest kind of experience. Um, and we've seen that political will now start to also drive out into other boroughs. So that has resulted uh, very much in in what we're now starting to see in the street space plan. This, this is, by the way, this is a picture of... Uh, Parliament, fairly obviously. Um, Parliament Square has a cycle superhighway, one of the one of the two and a half core routes that London had during Boris, uh, goes straight through Parliament Square. Um, this was, I think, last Monday. Um, last Monday was the highest ever uh, hire rate for Santander hire cycles, our docked uh, central London hire schemes. Um, are booming at the moment um, and this is what the streets look like right now in central London um, in outer London as well so where I'm based there is just uh, incredible amounts of family cycling um, and and we are in a situation now um, you know one of the things that I keep saying to everyone including all the politicians um, we're now in a situation where we have a, a, a momentary glimpse of the future we want um, in many ways you know we don't want 
coronavirus. We won't, don't want, you know, the, in the UK, the highest death rate in Europe. Uh, but we do want the clean air that has come uh, with the crisis. We do want to retain the walking and cycling rates that we're seeing. Um, and in fact, we kind of have to. So in London, it's a very large capital city uh, spread out across miles and miles and miles. Um, and as a result, we have very high uh, distance commutes. Um, those commutes now will not be do done on public transport. TfL estimates that um, around 15% of its previous maximum capacity will be available to people to get on buses and tubes. London moves at the moment, or it did before the crisis, on the bus and on the tube. That's how most Londoners get around. Um, so millions of those daily journeys will now no longer be available because of social distancing for the foreseeable future. Um, so we face a very, very stark situation, which is right now, this is what central London looks like. If I go out to Leebridge Road, I will be passed by children on bikes. I will see uh, people riding around who just were not on bikes before. Um, I can see NHS key workers getting to uh the local hospital you know to work and stuff like that um this is a glimpse of of a future that that we want um but the cars are coming back every day um and with them in a in a respiratory crisis comes the pollution um so and obviously you know we are pretty much tracking you know two graphs as the cars rise the number of people willing to cycle in, in current conditions goes down so um so we've been given this glimpse and we're fighting and talking to politicians all the time about saying you have a real choice now either you do this stuff fast um or this all disappears and all this stuff disappears um very very quickly this uh this is a street space plan and i think all of this leads directly to this which is that the politicians as i said are, are very much on board and our role now i think our role has been much more oppositional in the past and much more kind of punchy and uh, you know kind of there's been a bit of attack politics politics at times and there's needed to be you know uh so we've needed to do demonstrations that's needed to happen quite a lot we needed to do big mass rides we needed to do all sorts of things um that is less our role at the moment on the, certainly on a regional basis on, on the london wide basis um we have an alignment of, of political will um and as a result uh, the mayor came out with this street space plan uh, really you know and again this followed directly from our calls and other organizations calls to say this is what needs to happen you need to do this stuff and you need to do it fast as a result what we have is a plan um, that shows that that is is modeled by tfl to result in up to a tenfold increase in cycling um, now we currently have i think it's about 730,000 daily journeys uh, on bicycles um, and the the modeling is for a tenfold kilometer increase so that could mean say a fivefold cycling increase and loads of people riding from outer london who don't ride currently um but we don't know exactly how it cuts it cuts apart but but either way at the moment we're at a just under three percent mode share for cycling um i always said you know i'm 50 now i always said i'd retire when cycling was a mass uh, transport mode in london i'd be quite happy to go out bow out if we're well over 10 percent it now looks like we could be well over 10 percent in a year <laughs> or two so that's quite a strange feeling but but a very good one um so what you what you can see here on the left is uh is the street space plan the purple lines um that are the are the new emergency routes that are planned to go in very rapidly now i believe but we have not had confirmed that this is just phase one um this is what they're planning to do in the it, during the crisis and the current lockdown i.e in the next month or so um i think there's more coming because this doesn't reach far enough out into outer london what you can also see is there's some gray and red and other lines um those are our tube lines um and fairly obviously right now we've gone from a situation where a lot of the cycling schemes and a lot of the results that we were pushing for were about getting people to cycle to town centers replacing short car journeys etc and we're still trying to do that but we're now also very clearly from this map trying to replicate tube and bus routes because they won't be available and and what will happen is we've now faced a situation where if even a few percent people get into their cars that were on buses and tubes before we are utterly stuffed um, we're stuffed on congestion the whole city you know already runs at well under 10 miles an hour as, as the average speed uh, central london i think is about six miles an hour um, 
and you know someone i think there was a great headline someone said buses are now in uh, central london buses are now running slower than a horse and cart during victorian times uh, so london already has a massive congestion crisis um it can only get worse if people get into their cars even if it's only a few percent swap from bus or tube to cars um but on top of that obviously air pollution will really hit as well um and and as i said before you know it looks increasingly like this this virus um is both its spread and its lethality is exacerbated um, by high levels of air pollution. London has some of the worst air quality in, in Europe. So yeah, we really need to get this scheme going. So we're now looking at a scheme that not only aims to get short car journeys happening by cycle, but also long tube and bus journeys happening by cycle. Um, so it's a very strange condition, situation, but a lot of these routes will be very viable after the, the scheme, you know, after the whole thing runs. Um, what you can see in the bottom right is in Tower Hamlets, uh, that is Old Ford Road, and that is a, a modal filter or road closure or whatever you want to call it. Um, but basically, the, as well as these, uh, as well as these main road track schemes, the temporary track schemes that are coming in, um, and there are also now a whole plan. Uh, there's a massive plan for low traffic neighbourhoods, um, and in fact, we're seeing multiple boroughs as well as TfL push these openly um, and talk about entire boroughs going low traffic, kind of, and and major chunks of London. Um, so the street space plan talks about the city of London, which is the square mile, as it's also known our financial hub. Um, that going pretty much low car or car free. Um, on top of that, we have numerous of the bridges in central London going car free. Um, we have uh, big chunks of residential area going low car um, and these routes as well. Um, the issue, and I guess finishing off really, the issue now is pace. Um, so Paris has done, you know, the last I heard 35 kilometres of cycle track during the crisis as a temporary measure. We've done about 500 metres thus far from TfL, um, but we're now starting to see the boroughs pick up. So I was saying to Roxanne just before uh, the call started that we have um, last night, Hammersmith, the whole of Hammersmith gyratory went uh, cycle tracks all the way around it. Now the plan originally for Cycleway 9, which is where that scheme, where that area is, is uh, was only to do the northern side of the gyratory. But, but last night, a borough and a borough that's not known for doing loads and loads of schemes, has done the whole of the, the gyratory. So we're seeing boroughs now step up as well and some really surprising ones. So I think if we jump to the next slide, I think that covers most of the stuff that I was going to gibber on about. Um, I'm just checking my phone as well. Yeah, I think I think other than to really say, um, obviously, yeah, the, the two remaining things I was going to say briefly, one was that um, before we hand it over to questions and answers, I think, um, uh, one was that, that uh, just before the crisis hit, we um, published a report called Climate Safe Streets, which I think we're really, really proud of, everyone should read, but it's about recommendations to make London streets or any big city streets uh, carbon neutral by 2030. Um, and, and that's the point to make is as well is as well as this crisis, hopefully bringing us, a, you know, some some forward momentum to come out of this crisis, not going back to the status quo, but but, but moving forward, we also need to all recognise that there is a bigger crisis looming, you know, in the near future. Um, and that is the climate. So so really, if we come out of this crisis and go back to cars as they were not only have we failed on on pollution and COVID-19 and a second wave we've also failed on making sure that we use this moment to reduce our carbon emissions um, final point is uh, free membership for, I'm just going to do a plug free membership for NHS workers uh, and current offer for membership includes a, a free DLOC a gold secure sold secure DLOC um, and we're currently running an LCC advice line um, for anyone, not just members, everyone. Uh, so if you get in touch on Facebook Messenger or Twitter or email or phone or whatever, we will quite happily talk to people in London or beyond about routes, about, you know, how to lock your bike successfully, about, you know, tips and whatever and riding, etc. cetera. So, um, so I think, you know, but most importantly, any members, you know, anyone that gets involved, it helps us do our campaigning work. So that's our plug. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Simon, <laughs> for the third time. Um, I know that was probably just the tip of the iceberg of all the work that's been done to get to this point. And I'm sure the huge campaigning effort over the last few weeks and, um, and the plans for what we can see. Um, and I've, I, through all of the things that I'm seeing popping up around the world and particularly around England, 
I can't help but wonder, have we actually had secret allies sitting in these boroughs, sitting in these local authorities who maybe weren't um, brave enough yet to put their hand up or they didn't feel that they would get that um, public support and they've just been sitting on this enthusiasm and these ideas and now they're just going for it. Do you think that's happening? Yes, uh, is the short answer. I, there are fairly obviously there are, you know, there are, um, there's always been support because, you know, this stuff makes sense, you know, so, so sensible people do exist. Uh, and, and so there has always been support, but, but the problem is it's the top, you know, so, so as I said earlier, if there is a theme to my talk. And if there is a theme to, to probably everything I do, um, it is political will. Um, and so what I think is there's, there's several things happening at once. One is that we have been generating as, and not just LCC, Cam Cycle, many others in many other cities have been working on political will. And we've been getting better at it in a lots of ways. Um, I think that's really important. I think secondly, you know, certainly one of the stories in London, which I haven't told today is about engagement and consultation. We're learning rapidly how to actually talk to the public as are most of our councils and TfL and whatever. You know, one of the things we see in London is that, that, the vast majority of people over and over again in surveys say, you know, we, we want more cycling, we support cycling, we want to get rid of cars use, we, we want to cut cars. So people generally in London get it. They know they're breathing in lethal air. They know that the inactivity levels are horrific. They know that things aren't right. Um, they know road danger, you know, they can't step out at a crossing without risking their lives. So, so they know that there are problems and they see that. The problem then becomes when you say, right, okay, you like cycling, you want more cycling, but we're going to put a cycle track on your road at the end of your street, or we're going to close your street. And then they go, ah, and it all gets a bit hairy. So being able to talk to people, engage with people, to, to bring them on that journey to say, your abstract view is right, but how do we translate that down to your street, down to your area? And having those conversations, learning those conversations, the Walter Forest Mini Holland was very much part of it, I think has really helped people because so politicians increasingly you know not only will people back the general, but they'll back the specific. And I think that's been really important. But I also think, you know, this crisis, very simply, we've got local groups turning around to their politicians, you know, because, as I said, London is a patchwork. We have the mayor controls 5% of the roads via TfL, 95% of the roads are down to 33 boroughs that are all their own little fiefdoms. Some of those boroughs blatantly are not doing anything right now. You know, um, I think I've just seen Alex in the chat talk about Westminster um, and and you know that's a really surprising kind of sight to see Westminster Council openly talking about cycle tracks, openly talking about um, schemes. For those who don't know, Westminster Council is infamously anti-cycling. Yet they are coming out. You know now they've. But the point is they've been prodded by a lot of campaigning work. Um, there are other boroughs that are even further back behind. Uh, Westminster in terms of not doing anything in terms of openly saying they're not going to do anything now our campaigners are out every day saying this is the traffic count on the main road this is a cycle count look yesterday from yesterday you've gone up 10% on motor traffic and down 10% on cycling you know how long are you gonna wait here's the pollution levels on your main road how long are you gonna wait you know essentially we are now making the point very forcefully that, that a second wave a response to uh, the, this crisis will be on those politicians, you know, and we will remember. And I think there is some real power at the moment with advocacy because this crisis does genuinely represent a situation where if the cars come back, it will be disastrous. Yep. I agree. Okay, let's look at some of these questions. Well, I think we've, we've covered the question about, about Westminster. Um, I don't know if you can expand on that. Do you do you think they're they're for real? How have they finally been pressured into doing something after all that that resistance? Is it just this is the time? Do you think they'll backtrack on the temporary infrastructure or stick with it? They're certainly they're certainly being very they're being very clear in their documents that that all of the infrastructure they're going to put out is very temporary. You know, other boroughs, the mayor are like, this is a trial for a permanent scheme. You know, we're going to see if it works and make it permanent. And Westminster is still talking about, we're going to see, it. we're going to roll it out now and then probably take it back later. Um, they're not there yet, but they have been brought along a huge distance. Um, we we have uh, in Westminster now campaigner, Claire Rogers, who uh, was uh, did a lot of work in Enfield. She's been spectacular um, at getting things happening. And I think there's a coalition, there's a, there's a Westminster Healthy Streets Coalition that, that has really made inroads uh, in making the case. But also, again, you know, Westminster is, is 
I think facing a lot of other pressures as well. You know, what I'm seeing, you know, for instance, is uh, lots of people talking about Soho as a fairly obvious area. This is the, the heart of central London, um, an, an area of very narrow streets, very narrow pavements huge amounts of employment um, and loads of cafes and bars and restaurants it's the nightlife kind of area um, how that reopens with motor traffic you know it is just beyond any so I think you know again you're seeing Westminster businesses you're seeing the landowners and property developers you're seeing Westminster healthy streets you're seeing like noted local icons and things like that all saying we can't do this if the cars come back this doesn't work it just will not work so I think you know, Westminster have some very clear pressure on, the, on them to move. But I think they also have shifted, you know, they for, for the last few years, Westminster has been talking a very good game about air quality, not doing a lot about it, but at least talking about it a lot. So it's getting that, that will to then turn into action, which, you know, hopefully we're still on. <laughs> So um, a question from, from Michael from an L one of the LCC groups, Hounslow. Um, do you anticipate many battles has there, as there have been in the past for local road closures and filtering? And I'll add to that as well. Um, we know we've got the Quiet Ways program in London, but often they haven't been particularly quiet. So will we have these battles and will we see some of these Quiet Ways actually getting the interventions they need to, to have proper traffic calming? So I, th I think there is, again, you know, I think LCC's work means there is widespread recognition now amongst the boroughs that, that the idea of a quiet route is great. But if you just try and build a route through a quiet, you know, you try and build a route and, and somehow magically cycling will happen here. Um, but I think most boroughs get it. But the issue is, yeah, absolutely. We're going to still see opposition. But this is, again, this is the moment where putting in trial schemes like the Tower Hamlets one on Old Ford Road, you know, that, that scheme, no one was expecting Tower Hamlets to do it. They've just done it. They did it at a point where the traffic levels were still low enough that the rat runs weren't all back. Um, and as a result, people will have the chance to experience it. There was a trial of schemes in Walton Forest way back at the first low traffic neighbourhood. Um, and I think that trial really cemented in, in Waltham Forest the the idea of these schemes people could actually get out and feel it they could see kids cycling about they could see people sitting on a bench having a drink in the in the summer afternoon you know etc so i think the trials is, you know these schemes are going to be key to winning people over yeah agree and we were i was chatting to marco about this earlier that i find sometimes one of the challenges with campaigning is people actually can't imagine what we're talking about and we forget because this is our bread and butter we're always thinking about this and we have these amazing images in our mind of what li our lives and our streets could be like and people just can't imagine that but now finally we've given them this taste and we've sparked their imagination and now they know what we're talking about um, and we have to help yep. them campaign for it um, we've got a, a question from Peter in Melbourne um, in Australia in, in regards to the COVID-19 response from TFL, uh, do you know how they chose which streets to close and make bike only, bus only, et cetera? You know, what kind of tools were used? Is it low hanging fruit? And I would probably add to that as well, um, one of my questions, which is, is this very much a temporary network or have you got in, you know, do you think in the back of their mind, they're thinking about how this works more permanently, particularly balancing, you know, you've got these cycle routes along the tube line. Are they going to feed into the tube line later or be irrelevant if the tubes start running um, at capacity again? So uh, explicitly, if you, there, there is a TFL street space. I keep saying streetscape. It's not, it's street space. Uh, there is a TFL street space, which is the name, the plan, uh, Web page. So if you just Google TFL street space, or whatever, you'll find it. Um, th on that plan, so we've gone from, uh, and, and that's one of the big shifts in, in Boris's era, um, you know, there wasn't a big data approach to this stuff. It was just, this makes common sense, just do it. Um, and that has certain, how can I put it, there's a certain charm to that. There's a certain uh, efficacy to just having someone who just says, we're going to do this scheme. This scheme works. I know it works. Get on with it. Um, what TFL have shifted to and the mayor shifted to on the Will Norman is a very much data-led approach. So there is a thing called the strategic cycling analysis. 
very much like in the UK, we have a thing called the propensity to cycle tool. Um, and, and both of these are data led approaches to travel surveys, journey surveys, stuff like that, to say, okay, we know that there is a car journey from A to B that is currently under six kilometers, that is done by lots of people who aren't carrying heavy loads, that are able bodied, that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So these are journeys that should and could be cycled. Um, and there's lots of them happening from point A to point B. So let's make a cycle route from point A to point B. Um, and so there's high potential for cycling along this corridor or whatever. Um, London is, is in, in the strategic cycling analysis has already done this in general. And what that route, that set of routes looks like um, is very much town centre to town centre. It's very much kind of not just these radial routes going into London, which is what we were doing before. It's also lots of orbital routes, lots of other kind of inter town center routes. Um, but, you know, now we've got this new, so they've now done another big data exercise. And, and if you look at this, the street space guidance, there's some really good stuff on there. There's things like, here's a main road that we think needs cycling, but here's a bit of that main road, which is wide enough. Um, so we need to put in, a bus own bus and cycle only section or we need to get rid of all the parking at that point or something like that so they've they've really done some great analysis of where high potential low traffic neighborhoods are where there's too narrow for cycle tracks temporary cycle tracks and um, some of these routes may or may not work in the long term but the mayor is being very explicit on that page you can it says all of this stuff will be monitored all of this stuff will then be assessed for future permanent schemes so the idea is very much that these are going to be made permanent and ultimately the point is in london nearly all of the, the tube lines we're at or beyond capacity um you know one of the things i i was in barnet council a while ago barnet are not known for being cycle friendly and what was really interesting was the conversation started to talk about cycling because they had seen the modeling from tfl about their tube stations and their tube stations are at capacity right now yet they are predicted to have huge amounts of growth of housing in barnet so what happens when there's even more people you know tens of thousands of more people living in your borough and your tube lines are at capacity so actually replicating tube lines for instance in london makes really good sense anyway because people are fed up you know even before this crisis people are fed up of trying to squeeze onto a tube and being in someone's armpit for 45 minutes you know and and when you say to people you know you can get, you can basically get into a really sweaty horrible tube um or you can get on a bike they say well we're not going to get on a bike because it takes hours and it's really dangerous but actually it doesn't take hours you know most of our cycle routes are about as quick as the tube routes but it's the danger so get rid of the danger a lot of people can shift across. Yeah, excellent. So uh, another question from from Matt, and I, I partly know this answer because I know you do some uh, live stream videos once a week from your neighbourhood. But uh, do you video your neighbourhood cycling network to share with other boroughs to um, convince them how their areas could be rebuilt? And I'd say even beyond other boroughs, you know, we're really hoping that what's happening in your backyard is influencing the whole country. Well, I, I think it is, but there is a, I'm, I think we are right now seeing, a, you know, the, the, the negatives of British exceptionalism, <laughs> to be frank, uh, you know, politically, we have a tendency to think of ourselves as somehow a unique and superior country full of unique and superior people. Um, and that doesn't, I don't think, work very well when it comes to things like you know oh yeah we can go for herd immunity rather than uh, you know actually doing the job of saving lives etc so we have we have some issues with that and and i think the where that comes into kind of cycle campaign and things like that um i really remember uh you know when we started doing the walter boris mini holland stuff we we had over and over again people saying well but we're not holland you know you can't be a mini holland in northeast london we're not holland we're not dutch you can't be dutch as if the dutch are some kind of alien species with like three arms or something um and then we were like but hang on a minute actually really the mini holland is a bit of a misnomer what we've done is we've taken low traffic neighbors which hackney which is the next borough over has been doing for decades so we're doing something that's only two miles away a mile away um and we're doing cycle tracks, you know, which you can find in central London. Oh, no, 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 but we're not Hackney. As if the people in Hackney had three arms, you know. And then what I noticed was that we actually had old no, low traffic neighbours in, in bits of all the forest that had been put in the 70s and 80s. And actually a lot of bits of the UK 
in the 60s, 70s and 80s, people were closing rat runs. For some reason that stopped, but you can find in most councils, you can find bits of quiet neighborhoods that were done at some point where there was a rat run through it and someone just filtered it. And so we, we, we looked at that and we were like, but there's the Mark House area is actually filtered already. I know, but we're not like the Mark House. They're, they're 500 meters away. Yes, you are like the Mark House people. Come on. You know, how close do you have to be? And, and we see that exceptionalism all over. So people go to all the forest and we've had the councils that don't really get it you know, or they don't want to get it. They've come to Walter Price, they've visited, they've walked around and they've gone, this is amazing, this is lovely, but you had 30 million pounds of funding. And we were like, but the low traffic neighbourhoods bit is really cheap, you can do this easily. Oh, no, no, we can't do that. Why can't you do that? Why can't? So I think the tools have been really important. You know, Paul and Dan, I can't praise them enough for, you know, doing the amount of tools. And, and, and we've had councils from all over the UK come and that has been a really visceral experience. Um, there is a video, there's an amazing video online. Uh, if you just Google five years of, uh, of enjoy Walton Forest, um, I think, you'll, you know, there's a great, great video that shows a lot of what's, what's happened. Um, but showing people a video, I'm afraid to say, is, isn't, I don't think it's the answer. If, if someone doesn't have political will before they see the video, they won't have it after they see the video. What you need to do is, is find what motivates them um, and get them to care you know, about cycling. And, and the honest answer is cycling, you know, is I feel incredibly, you know, I'm quite glad I'm a cycling campaigner rather than, I, you know, a campaigner about other things because actually it's so easy to make the case on cycling. It's such a win-win for everything you know so if you care about social justice cycling is an answer if you care about health cycling is an answer if you care about the environment cycling is an answer if you care, you know so pretty much anything that might motivate a politician from the left or from the right from you know wherever they split on party lines or wherever they sit there is there's a reason why cycling is actually quite an important thing to consider but you need to kind of unlock that in people somehow and, and videos don't i'm afraid do i wish they did <laughs> We have to get them to the point where they start asking, oh, how do we do that? And then we bring the video in. But we've got yeah. to, get to that point of asking that question, don't we? Yeah. yeah and, I you know, I think it's it, one of the things we're seeing in London a lot at the moment right now is we're seeing lots of boroughs where the council has got kind of a medium level of political will. And they turn around and say, oh, but my officer says no, my office is this, my office is that. We can't do it because of here's 50 reasons. Now, officers are incredibly good at finding reasons if they don't want to do something. Um, but if a council really has political will, the conversation doesn't become, oh, well, I asked and they said no. The conversation becomes, I'm the cabinet lead on this. I've told you can't do that. Find me solutions. It might not be exactly what I asked for, but you're going to find me something that looks roughly right, you know. And and that the moment that you start having those conversations with council leads, you know that you're on a good like that's when you're on the right road. And it is, you know, at the end of the day, political will is everything. I, I think it, you know it's easy to have words. You know, Westminster's got great words right now. When I see schemes go in, when I see the program accelerating, when I see actually things happening then I can say, and, and then facing down residents and then facing down officers. That's the moment at which I'm going, all right, that's what political will looks like. Yeah. So a really, really short answer for this one and then we'll go to the last question. Um, in the guidance that the government has released, they have basically said, if councils don't get on with this, we're going to come and get involved. Do you, do you foresee that that might happen for some of these reluctant councils or boroughs? So, it's <laughs> a, a very different really question. For me. So, so the simple, the simple answer is: uh, so we have, we have, we don't just have a cycling prime minister. His key transport advisor, Andrew Gilligan, is is famous or infamous, loved or hated uh, for his attitudes on transport and cycling. He's a massive advocate of cycling, whatever else you think of him. Um, he, if anyone, is likely to come into a council and just take over it's probably andrew gilligan um and whether that is even achievable or doable legally or whatever you know i think is slightly under question but flip it i'm just going to rattle that saber as long as and hard as i can because because you know it is some it's a lever that someone has given me i'm going to use that lever yeah so if we can't get that political will through our convincing arguments a bit of fear might bring it on board fear greed uh, love, hate, you know, what it, whatever works, really. I'm a, I'm a very much a by any means necessary kind of guy. Yeah. 
Right, I'm going to make this one then the last question and it's from Marco. Um, so where will the largest resistance come from? And in the 1920s, we also thought that city streets would never allocate car traffic. Roads were not built for cars. Um, and then how to link up with much wider, a much wider group of people to ensure a majority will keep fighting for it. And, and I see that as being, you know, where are our allies and our alliances that, that we can build? And I'll say we're already seeing that internationally and nationally, the amount of collaboration that is going on right now is incredible, but we're still a bit in our echo chamber. So how do we bring more and more people in? Uh, your, your ideas are probably as good as mine, but you know, build coalitions, uh, have a broad conversation, bring residents with you, you know, talk, clearly and simply and positively be a critical friend to politicians I, it's just all the the tools of campaigning that everyone is amazing at you know it, it, london is not uniquely brilliant at doing this stuff very obviously because we're not we're far from there yet you know um but just keep doing all the stuff that we're doing and keep learning from each other i think is, is probably the biggest key on this one um i think there's so much kind of efficacy in good positive language um i don't do enough of that but but that is a really really positive thing um i think coalition building is massively the key for us in certainly in london where cycling has been viewed as this kind of alien thing um and in the uk you know we are seeing huge gains from forming things like healthy streets or better streets group you know because who doesn't want a healthy street and who doesn't want a better street you know it's very easy to say oh i don't like cycling um but if you say you know, I don't like healthy streets. <laughs> what kind? Of, you know, you can't do it. You can't. You know. So I think there is, and I think you know, having that coalition of social justice and green, and um, you know, all sorts of things. But you know, at the end of the day, it, it does cross across so many lines. You know, it's great we have in in the UK. We have a very strong Labour cycles movement now, but we also have quite a strong Conservative cycles movement now. So you know, politically, if you want small government and low kind of you know low public purse levels, you know, and you want an efficient population you know healthy population is a good thing so cycling is great that way you know so there, there are all sorts of ways to cut this and all sorts of people to bring in you know i just last night i was talking to a load of taxi drivers who are the the biggest enemy for cycling in london you know um and i was talking to them about the huge common ground there is between us and actually there is masses of common ground they may, they're not going to agree on everything but they're going to agree on some things yeah absolutely we've got to look for those parts that we agree on and, and build from there don't we yeah yeah Excellent. Right. Well, I'll say to everyone, um, I'm not sure what time we're finishing, but we might have time for a bit of off the record chat. Um, but I'm just going to do the obligatory plug. And before we do that, I'll say thank you so much, Simon, for um, coming in and having a chat to us. And it's such a crazy time. Uh, so really, really appreciate that you found the time and, you know, it wasn't particularly well organized this week because I'm also struggling with the campaigning, but we got there um, and we know that this will reach hundreds of people online all around the world. And I think that um, there was just so much to take from this today uh, about just how do we actually convince people, the right people. Um, so thank you as always, Simon, you are leading the way there. And I will get this plug one moment. I was told by George, George couldn't make it today. And it, it turns out we managed to, to have almost a double booking. There's two sessions today. So if you didn't get enough this morning, uh, the Urban Cycling Institute has another webinar um, this afternoon, if you're in Europe 